One recent study indicates that other than in church, the average born-again Christian spends five minutes per month reading the Bible. What a statistic. Could it be possibly because we just don't understand how to read the Bible? Well, coming up on today's show, Pastor Peter continues to unveil principles that will make reading the Bible a great joy and no longer a frustration. God's love, elevating, energizing, empowering. Miracles happen when you know that you are loved. Peter Youngren has communicated God's love with millions from every religion and culture. Get ready for your ultimate life because you are loved. Welcome to You Are Loved. My name is Megan. Today we continue with the topic, how to read the Bible. Reading the Bible is meant to be exciting and fun, not full of frustration or confusion. Have you ever felt that way? I know I certainly have. If you grew up in church, you were taught from a young age that the B-I-B-L-E, that's the book for me. But how can it be the book for me if I just don't get it? especially the Old Testament. Well, today, Pastor Peter enlightens us on how to read the Old Testament. You might even be surprised to see how excited you will be to read the Old Testament after this teaching. Enjoy. So let me give you a little bit more on how to read the Old Testament. This is so fascinating. Here's, here's a scripture verse, 1 Corinthians 10, where Paul writes like this, Our fathers were under the cloud, and they all passed through the sea. And they were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Well, again, when you read the book of Exodus, when you read the book of Numbers, you don't have Christ mentioned there. You just have this story. You have a story that Moses smote the rock and then water flowed. And then you have a second story where he was supposed to just speak to the rock. It's very, very important. But he didn't because he doubted, so he smote the rock again. And the amazing thing is, even though Moses disobeyed God, the water still flowed. Isn't that fascinating? So the rock is very central there. So let me just comment on that. So why is it that he could only smite the rock once? But here we have the answer. We just read it. That rock was Christ. Everybody say, that rock was Christ. And Christ was only supposed to be smitten once. Once for all. Once for all he put away our sins. Once for all he has sanctified us. Everybody say, once for all. That, that, that's marvelous. Once for all. I mean, it is, I, mean I don't know what it means in, in, in your language in French or in Russian or what language you speak, but once in English means once. It doesn't mean twice. And in Swedish, it means once. It doesn't mean twice or three times. There's not much room for, there's not much wiggle room for misinterpretation. Once means once. And for all, it doesn't mean for most. It means once for everyone. So Moses, he, he probably didn't know that. Maybe he had some, some sense of God's leading that he could only smite the rock once, but he, to him it was a rock. But Paul says, no, that rock is Christ. So then the second time around, he was supposed to speak, which is what we do. We don't sacrifice Jesus afresh. When we take the Lord's table, the communion, we don't say that Jesus is dying afresh, but we speak the word. The word is near us in our heart and in our mouth, the word of faith which we preach. So Moses disobeyed, and he thought he didn't, he didn't, he didn't have Paul's epistles to read, so let's give Brother Moses a break. I mean, we're not smarter than Moses. He didn't have Paul's epistles. So he smote it again. And God told him, don't do it. Now, the amazing thing to me is that the water still flowed. You say, well, God, he just disobeyed you. But the people didn't even notice. It looks so good to the people. The anointing is flowing. The water is flowing. And, and, and he disobeyed you. And then God had a little talk to Moses about that later on. But you know what that shows me? God can bless us in spite of our dumb activities. Come on, this, turn to your neighbor and say, there's hope for everyone. <laughs> How many have ever done anything dumb? Come on, anybody done anything dumb here? Anything done anything wrong? Moses did something really dumb. He disobeyed God, but God still let his blessing flow to the people. That tells me God is an awesomely good God. 
Have I ever done something wrong? Have you ever kind of lost your cool or something and, and you were in the middle of a situation and you needed God and God still helped you? Uh, that's, that's, that doesn't condone the wrong we did. Come on now. But it just does prove that God is good in spite of my, oh, I'm getting blessed just saying this. God is good in spite of our stupidity. Oh, I tell you, I think of all the stupid things I used to do. I used to put such pressure on sick people, you know. I didn't mean to because my father was sick with diabetes. I know what sickness is, but he said, you need more faith. You need more faith. You know, that's very tough to say to somebody who's half dead already. You need more faith. <laughs> I'm not going to pray for you until you exhibit more faith. I, I meant well, but I was stupid. But the amazing thing is God still heals some people. That's what blows me away. God was still good. I was doing the best I could. I did what other preachers had done. I thought that's the way to do it. I didn't realize I was like a Pharisee laying, having burdens some people. And then gradually I began to learn and God showed me. You're laying burdens on sick people. You're supposed to lift their burden. Don't keep telling them, oh, you need more faith. You need more faith. You need more faith. Because they felt so bad. You know, God had to teach me this. I'm really getting off topic, but is it all right? God had to teach me this. I was a little dense. I was up at our tent in northern Ontario. And this was a turning point. And I was for a while, and I, I still pick it up. I had read a Smith Wigglesworth book that Smith Wigglesworth used to say in his services, who wants to get healed first today? So I thought, I'm going to do that. I got the same God as Smith Wigglesworth. I'm going to say, who wants to get healed first? And whose ever hand I see go up, that's the one I'm going to go down and lay hands on. And so I was doing that, and it was working really good. For several weeks, every night, just without fail. Whoever I picked out first, they were healed. I thought, this is going good. I was in Thunder Bay, northern Ontario. And I said, who wants to get healed first? And I can still see it this lady with kind of fake blonde hair uh, in her 60s. I saw this hand go up. I said, you! I just picked her. So she comes up and she's walking like, like this. I said, well, you know, I'm going to pray for you and you're going to be healed. I said, what's your problem? She says, for seven years I have not been able to bend my back. I just go like this. It's frozen. I've had surgeries. I said, no problem. I want to lay hands on you in the name of Jesus and you're going to touch your toes. She looked at me and said, you are crazy. And I was because I had the microphone in front of her mouth. I should have just let her say it, but now everybody could hear. She said, you're crazy. I can't touch my toes. Didn't you hear me? I, have, I, I haven't done that for seven years. Oh, I said, well, you just need more faith. You need more faith. Well, I said, you know, I quoted two scripture verses. I said, do you believe yet? She says, no. <laughs> and, you know, the meeting had been going pretty good in Thunder Bay. I mean, it was a good atmosphere. You know, it was like a good kind of meeting. The music was good. But and I'm gonna tell you, any good feeling in the meeting was evaporating quickly. And I could, I'm pretty good at reading people's faces. And I know what they were thinking. They were thinking Younger must have committed some terrible sin because he lost the anointing since last night. And there's something terrible going on here. You know, he has no anointing left. And I tend to agree with them. I think I lost it wherever the Holy Spirit was. He's gone. And so I was trying. So, so then I did something stupid, stupid, stupid. I said to the woman, you know, I have a book table in the back. You need to get my teaching on the keys to divine healing and listen to my teaching and come back tomorrow. See, I'm trying to blame her subliminally. In other words, if you could just listen to more of Peter Youngren's teaching, then you'll really be healed. So I'm piling it on her like that. I didn't know any better. I was stupid. She said, I'm not going to pray for you. Come back tomorrow. So she starts walking off the platform. She's walking in there. I still remember this. She's walking off like this. And I'm feeling really bad. And the meeting is dead. We may as well go home because it's over. I mean, no, when it's over, it's over. I'm not going to call anybody else to pray for them because I know if there was any faith here, it's gone. But you know, God is so good. He helps people even when we're stupid. So she's walking. She's almost getting over the step, stepping down. And I hear a voice that says to me inside, Peter, help the woman. 
something and help the woman? Am I not trying to help her? <laughs> Quote, help her. So I didn't know what to do. I, I just felt like, stop. I said, stop. Can you, can you come here? I want to, I'm supposed to help you. Thank you. And I said to her, would you like to be healed? She looked at me. What do you think I'm here for? It's like, how dumb are you? What do you think I'm up here for? So, so I said, and it kind of set me free. I said, oh, oh, so, so you want to be healed? Of course. She said, that's why I came here. I said, well, well I also would like for you to be healed. Oh, oh, she said. So I said, we're in agreement. And you know, it just solved everything. So I've been piling burdens on her. I didn't deserve to see healed, but she got healed in front of everybody. And people who were leaving the meeting, they were halfway out down the hall because they thought this is over. They come running back and say, I can't believe this. This woman is healed. She's jumping and dancing. So what I'm saying to you, I didn't know how to handle the situation. I think in retrospect, I was, if I'd had my way, I would have put pressure on that woman. But God helped me. And God let the water flow. So don't worry about your prayer formula. That you pray exactly this way or that way, and that's going to work. And if I just do this right, no, you know, just just go slow and say, Jesus, help me. So how do we read the Bible? Well, no one better. Now, Paul is a wonderful teacher, but no one better than Jesus to show us. In just a moment, we will go back to the teaching. But first, if you've enjoyed what you've heard today or this week, make sure to order a copy of the teaching series. All the information is on the screen on how to place your order. Now let's get back to the teaching. And right after the teaching, we will go immediately into some studio audience questions. And Jesus shows us exactly how to read the Bible. Go to Luke chapter 24. Luke 24. You remember Jesus is now risen and there's some disciples called the disciples on the road to Emmaus. You remember the Emmaus was a village. It was about an 11 kilometer, seven mile walk from Jerusalem to Emmaus. And this stranger appears to them and he gives them a Bible study. Wouldn't you have loved to be there for the Bible study of Jesus? So you don't have to take Peter Youngren's word for it. You could just believe Jesus Christ yourself, okay? So what did Jesus say? Because they are there. They don't understand. And what's happened, you know, the one we trusted in, he has died. And they don't understand. And they're confused. And, and, and they're trying to read the Bible. And then Jesus says like this. And I'm going to read the whole, we can read the whole chapter. But Luke 24, 25 to 27, he says, Oh, foolish ones. And slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory and beginning at Moses? Everybody say beginning at Moses. Beginning Moses. Here we have Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Do, 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 Deuteronomy. He says, beginning at Moses. This is a long Bible study Jesus gave them because you've got to get through all the books of Moses. And all the prophets. I mean, you have to be in this Bible study for the long haul. He goes through all the books of Moses and all the prophets. And he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Everybody say, all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. You say, and we're talking about the 39 books of the Old Testament. Well, I never noticed Jesus' name in the Old Testament. But he's taking them through. He says, look, look, look here. Look here, he says. Come on, you disciples. You see this ark of Noah here? That's a picture of me. I'm your salvation. And people ran into the ark and were saved. You run into me and you're saved. See, he, he said, look, look at that. That's me. That, that's me. Look at this here. Look at this first animal sacrifice. That's a picture of how I have identified with the world's shame and guilt. That, that's me It's talking about that. That's me. Look at this. Look at the Aaron's rod that budded and brought new life. That, that, that's me. I, I, you have life in me. And he goes through all those scriptures. And wow, this changes everything, how we read the Old Testament. Because now, what is the Old Testament? It's a treasure hunt. It's not, well, if David did this, if David... 
killed 200 Philistines and brought the foreskins to his father-in-law's dowry. Bless God, should I do the same thing? No, you shouldn't. Because you're not supposed to find life principles from David or, 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 or somebody else. Or, uh, you're supposed to find Jesus in the Old Testament. People say to me, you still read the Old Testament, Peter? Of course, it's more exciting than ever. Jesus is our Joshua. Moses, the law, could not bring you into the promised land. It just couldn't be. Moses did not enter the promised land until much later on when he came on the Mount of Transfiguration. Why couldn't he enter? Because he represents the law. It took Joshua, which is the Old Testament word for Jeshua, Jesus. The only way that you can get to the promised land of milk and honey is not by your effort. It's not by Moses. It's not by the law. It's by your Joshua, Jesus Christ. He's teaching them all of this. He's teaching them. And then he goes on in Luke 24, a little bit later on, same chapter. He's talking to his disciples. He says, all things must be fulfilled, which was written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms. So now the Bible study gets bigger. Now it's all the books of Moses and all the prophets and Psalms. That's 150 more chapters. I tell you, Better have some Red Bull for this Bible study to stay awake. Jesus is going through all this here. And he says, all these speak concerning me. It must have been a shocker to them. We have studied. We had to memorize the scriptures. And they're all about you, Jesus. You mean it's all about you? He said, yeah, you're going to find me there. This makes Old Testament reading exciting. You know, sometimes reading the Bible can be pretty. I'll tell you one thing. You start reading the genealogies. If you can't sleep at night, you know, don't take a sleeping pill. Just start reading the genealogies. So-and-so begat so-and-so and so-and-so begat so-and-so. And by about verse 7, you'll be snoring. <laughs> don't be mad at me for saying that. You know, you say, well, I, I, I don't get it. But see, now I'm excited about the Bible. I said, I said that study showed that the average evangelical outside of church or Bible study only spends five minutes a, mo a month in the Bible. Why? Because we don't understand what we're reading. But if we open up and say, oh, I got to find, I got to find Jesus. I got to find a picture of Jesus here. Something about Jesus that will help me to walk with Jesus today. And you are on a treasure hunt. And he says, he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. That's what I'm talking about, comprehending the scriptures. Not just reading your seven or nine chapters a day so you can say, oh, I did it again. I've read through the Bible 59 times. Wear a medal. But you, you know, sometimes you don't need to read the whole chapter. You just read one verse. Some people read too fast because you're kind of a, Competing, how many verses, how much you can get through. Some of the Bible is so heavy, you just want to maybe read one verse or one sentence. When I think about Ephesians 1, 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us. Oh, you might want to pause right there and say, oh, I need to digest this. I need to chew this like a cow chews the cup. To kind of feel that. He has blessed me with all blessings, all blessings in heavenly places. In, oh, my, he said, well, what's exempted? Are there any exemptions? You, you, it might take your whole week just to go through that one verse and you completely lose the Bible reading contest, reading through the Bible because you're stuck in Ephesians 1, 3, and it just becomes part of you. So, oh, my God, oh my God, he is blessed. God is blessed. God the Father is blessed. And he's blessed me with every spiritual blessing. Oh, oh, la, la, oh, my, mama mia. Hallelujah. Are, are you with me? And so, you, so, so take it easy. Take it easy. Don't, don't try to cover too much. And then when we read the New Testament, so we filter everything through Jesus. The New Testament, you know, you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those books have one thing in common. They happen before the death and resurrection of Jesus. They happen before. So you got to see who is Jesus talking to. Sometimes Jesus say, I tell you, and he talks to the scribes and Pharisees. But then he says, you know, in that day when the spirit has come, it's going to be totally different. 
He's talking about us. You know, so again, when he says, you know, cut off your hand and rip out your eye, he's not talking to you. He's talking to people who are so self-righteous Pharisees. He said, if, if you want to go that way, don't do it, but this is what it would take. So you say, I don't, I don't want to put myself in that basket of the Pharisees. How many, how many are new covenant believers? Just so saying, that day, you ask the Father whatever, whatever in my name, and he'll give it to you. And so you read it, and, and you divide the truth of the word of God. And you understand that in Jesus, we have all of Scripture for the so many of my Christian brothers and sisters are angry with Muslims here in North America. How do I talk about the love of Christ, even for Muslims, to angry Christians? Well, that's very sad, of course, but it's understandable in one way. We are fed constant stories, and they're true stories of Muslims who are doing terrible things towards Christians and towards other Muslims, to be fair. So I understand that. And so what I'm trying to help people do is to see, first of all, my allegiance, number one, is to Jesus Christ. Before I'm a liberal or a conservative or whatever I am, number one, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ and his gospel. That goes beyond anything. It goes beyond political or national identity, ethnicity, and everything. I'm, I'm, I'm faithful to Jesus Christ. And so it's very difficult to hate people and be faithful to Jesus. How many have found you might have tried to do that? It's very difficult to keep hating people and say, oh, thank you, Jesus, for living through me. I find that extremely difficult. I've tried a few times. And so I think what we, what we are doing here consistently in, in, is we're showing people that all the world is included in God's salvation plan. And we are not excusing. I feel like many other people, when I hear people, Muslims doing terrible things, or any group of people doing terrible things, I, I feel the same revulsion that anybody else feels. But then I go back to, I'm a Jesus follower, and yes, I'm angry at those people for doing that. So, so much more do they need the gospel. So much more. Paul was a terrorist. Saul of Tarsus was a terrorist. We, we forget that sometimes. He was, a, he was breathing murder. We don't know whether he actually committed very likely. He did commit, but we don't know that. He was at least breathing murder and hatred. So he was a disgusting person. He was a, a person that would create revulsion in us. You would hate that guy. Say, somebody, somebody beat that guy up at least. Throw him in jail. But he changed. And so we, we have to believe that God's love can change people's lives. And I believe that. So I'm going to stick to that. I'm sticking to it. It's my story. It's a ministry with a heart as big as the whole wide world. It started in a small missions chapel. That fair first service, I just had one goal in mind, that somebody would receive Christ as their Savior. I hoped to preach for 10 minutes, but I didn't last that long. I didn't have enough to say. But at the end of it, two people came to the Lord. The vision only grew stronger, and a couple of years later, Peter Youngren had moved to Providence, Rhode Island, Zion Bible Institute. It was during that time that I saw a vision, and, and it, it changed my life. It, it put such a passion in me to touch the world with the gospel. In a way, I became like an untamed tiger. I just wanted to break out of the whatever confinement I was in. And sometimes that confinement was within the, the Christian church where we were so much about ourselves and reach out to those who had never known Jesus. That passion has continued unabated for 40 years with some of the largest gospel outreaches ever, especially in countries that are normally considered impossible. Just like the Apostle Paul, Peter seeks to gain a foothold for the gospel by first meeting with political and religious leaders Amazingly, God opens the heart of prime ministers, presidents, governors, and leaders of various religions. Friendship festivals are just that, events often held in large stadiums where the good news of Jesus Christ is presented uncompromisingly and yet in an attitude of respect and friendship towards all. Gospel Revolution seminars have impacted 356,000 leaders and counting, an extensive training that reintroduce pastors, bishops, and leaders to the simplicity and yet profound power of Christ's gospel. Through media, believers are enlisted in the cause of Christ 
and many hear the gospel often for the very first time. The most recent media outreach, a 24-7 Christian television station in the world's largest Muslim city, is nothing short of a miracle. On an average, 2,000 Muslim friends respond to Christ every month, something unheard of in the Islamic world. But newborn believers, more than 16 million over the last 25 years, need nurturing. And so the teaching booklet, Salvation, God's Gift to You, becomes their first introduction to the Christian faith. All this, plus ongoing ministry in Israel, Bible schools in different parts of the world, long-term missionaries, and much more, is made possible by partners. Partnership is more than giving. It is people who stand shoulder to shoulder for the gospel. The VIP family are the monthly partners who form the backbone of the ministry. Because of the VIP family, we're able to say yes to the challenges that come to us. Because we know we have people who stand shoulder to shoulder with this ministry. And they believe like I believe that everyone has a basic human right to hear the gospel. You know, it, it, it's a great tragedy to me that millions of people are born, they live and they die and never hear the gospel. But I'm thankful for the many who are rallying to the cause, who have discovered that it's a real blessing to become involved with the gospel. And so thank you to the VIP family. Make your life count for souls, for eternity, for the gospel. Jesus said that when we give for his sake and for the gospels, we receive a maximum return. Truly those who bless Jesus Christ and his gospel are blessed. Call now, 1-877-974-7223 or give online at feederyoungren.org. VIP stands for Visionaries in Partnership. Will you become a monthly VIP and partner with Peter Youngren and World Impact Ministries to continue to help spread the love of Jesus to the unreached people who have never heard about him before? It's because of the VIP family that make this possible. We are passionate to share Jesus, as I know you are too. Becoming a partner is very easy. All you have to do is call the number on the screen. You can sign up by using your credit card or using your bank account information. You can also do this on our safe and secure website. Thank you for doing something significant and making an impact. If you have a prayer request, call the Grace Prayer Center. Someone will take your call and pray with you. Thank you for watching today's program. I trust you have been enlightened and encouraged on how to read the Bible. Remember, you are loved. Thank you. Your partnership makes this ministry possible. To share your prayer request or to help bring the good news of Jesus Christ to thousands who have never heard, call 1-877-974-7223. You can give at www.peteryoungren.org or send your gift to World Impact Ministries at PO Box 2108, Vista, California, 92085-2108 or 190 Railside Road, Toronto, Ontario, Canada, M3A 1A3. Together, let's give everyone a chance to hear the gospel.